Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, Lord, multiply the seats if we need to, because it'll be too time-consuming to move. So if we do get more folks in, maybe some of the gentlemen can just stand and let some ladies sit. But um, I can't tell you how much it means to me to see the parents out, because my heart is for the youth. I love you guys, obviously, but I have such a heart for the youth. I served in my own youth group uh, in my church in New Jersey for over eight years, still have relationships with uh, many of them and their children. Um, but it's hard when I can't tell the kids that mom and dad understand, so they're a safe place, so go home and talk to your mom and dad about this. But when you guys have a better understanding of what Gen Z is experiencing or your older children, but I go to youth groups, so I'm probably not going to be talking to your older children, but for those of you with Gen Z children, when, when I can tell them that, that your mom and, and dad care about you so much, they took a night out to come and learn more, it really sets the tone for the rest of the night, sharing with the kids. We know that kids won't generally say it, but mom and dad, you're the most important person in their lives. You're the one that they want respect from and love from, even when they're giving you the eye roll or whatever. It's you. It's you. So thank you for being here. I just want to open uh, with scripture because I will admit, and uh, the Lord knows, my words always fail. My words always fail, fail, but God's word never fails. His word is forever settled in heaven. Amen? Second Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 8. We'll see how far the Lord takes me. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And then verse 12, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. Thank you that you have uh, given us a heart to, to repent and believe and receive the free gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we were once dead, but we are alive in you so that we can be filled with you for your glory's sake, for our sake, and to edify the body of Christ, knit together as one in you, and to show a dying world who you are. So be with us now. Lead and guide and direct this time we have together, God. We love you and we praise you and we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Um, as, as Josh has said, my name is Patty Height, and the ministry that God has given me is Out of Egypt Ministries. I am not Egyptian and tried to get out of Egypt. Middle Eastern food is my favorite food. <laughs> Egypt in the spiritual sense, my place of slavery and bondage was my understandable, circumstantial, self-proclaimed identity of, of gay and and gender non-conformed leaning in the masculine, that was my place of bondage. It was actually what I called my freedom. But praise be to God, he took me out of that bondage and brought me into his promised land and set my feet on his firm foundation. And so that doesn't matter. My name, I don't even want you to remember my name when you leave here. What I want you to remember is who our God is and that he fights for you and he's fighting for your children. And our God is a God of victory. Listen, Satan knows he can't take your life. So he's trying to steal your hope. Don't let him. We have victory. We have victory. So before I start, I just want to share, uh, as we're talking about kids tonight, 
I want to share these verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Listen, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So the world is teaching our children anything and everything but how to love the Lord with every part of who they are and how to keep his word. They're actually telling our kids the uh, social media protests, the news, big business. Everyone is telling our kids that, that if they're following his word, that they're actually being hateful towards certain people groups. The world seems to have gone mad. It's crazy. I feel like after I, I study and, and see what's happening and, and, and look to see what's going on in the various platforms that I, I have to understand and, and see and be aware of, I feel like I need to take my eyes out at night and, and wash them. And that's just through a screen. But people are experiencing it face to face, as Josh was saying, some of these, you know, I, for, for years I didn't post too much on social media. I'm, I'm more of a stalker than a, than a poster. But, you know, <laughs> I can't. It, it's, you know, Pride Month, is, it's gone up a, a notch or two. Even back when I would go to Pride Parades in New Jersey and New York City because of where I lived, I got a two for each month. Even then, I was kind of like, especially when I was in the city, in New York City, I was a little bit like, ooh, you know, you'd be, be people walking, like going down Christopher Street or whatever, and it's like, yeah, 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 and then you'd see something on a float, and it's like, I do not want to see that. And that was me in the life in my 20s and 30s. And now there's parents there with their, their children. And so... I'm going all out. I'm posting it all on social media. I don't know of any of you that follow me, but did you guys see that Burger King post? Did any, does anybody follow me on, on social media? Thank you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, if you just look at it, it's just uh, two burgers with some rainbow colors and then Burger King on the bottom and the E is like the rainbow. But if you look closer, one burger is two top buns and the other burger is two bottom buns. And it's more than just same, same. It's top and bottom, which is very sexual because being a top, I'm sorry, we're going to get raw and real tonight. If you, you guys, just remember, I love you. <laughs> being a top or being a bottom is very big in the gay community, whether you are sexually a top or sexually a bottom, and they're putting it at Burger King. So when we take our five-year-olds through the drive through this is what they see. And what if Satan's already planting seeds of deception in their heart and they start asking questions? You know what they're going to remember from these things that they see when they're little? They'll remember that, but they won't remember the beautiful birthday party that you had for them because that's what Satan does. He tries to steal our memories. Man, I can't wait for the Lord's return. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All right, if I go that much off my notes, we're going to be here till nine. Thank you, child care. <laughs> but I, I'm sure 20 years ago, none of us thought that we would be having a packed room of parents' night to find out all that we can about LGBT concerns, and yet this is where we find ourselves. So what we're going to be going through tonight is, is if the Lord leads me to, to my notes, uh, we're going to be talking about some things to look for, things we can do in our home to, to be proactive with this. Um, it's, it's, we're going to generally talk about our, our littles and then our tweens and teens. And because there's so much to talk about, um, I'm probably not going to uh, have a lot of time to talk about our adult children, but we are going to have a time of Q&A, so hopefully we can talk there and as well as those uh, what do I do when or what do I do if questions, okay? So 
the first thing I want to say, this is, this is, you ready? Mom and dad, take a deep breath. God is good and God is sovereign. And he knew this was coming for us. He knew there was going to be such a time as this. He knew as he was knitting you together in your mother's womb, he knew what would be taking place as he was knitting your child together in your womb. God has prepared us for this because he's a good God. It actually says in Acts chapter 17 that, that he formed us all from one blood and that he has given us pre-appointed times and pre-appointed places so that we would grope for him. So our time and our place, Chino Valley, 2022, he's appointed this. And here we are groping for him. It's actually a beautiful thing, even though it doesn't seem that way. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay. So uh, I just want to talk about how we can biblically and practically navigate our families in the LGBT plus culture that we live in. And we know that social media is loaded with gay and trans ideology. I mean, it is loaded. Social, that's pretty much what social media is now, either blatant or underlying. We know that every TV show has a gay or trans character, cartoons, and Disney, don't even get me started with Disney. So what do we do with that? Do we get scared? Do we get angry? Do we get vocal? Do we get complacent? Do we throw our hands in the air and conform to the culture because we feel defeated and exhausted talking about it and hearing about it? Do we question God's word all of a sudden because now our kid is identifying? And we know that our kid is, is a good kid. How could this happen to our family? We raise them in the foundation of the truth. Maybe I've read the truth wrong. It's happening everywhere. But God, do we bury our heads in the sand and pretend it'll eventually go away? We cannot do that. Do we tell ourselves it won't affect our children because they've been raised in a Christian home? Or do we trust what the Lord says in Romans 8, 28, when he says, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. We're not just called, you guys. We are the called. And that's a big deal. We have to trust the Lord's working mightily in this culture we live, live in, even though it seems like Satan is winning. He's already lost. He's basically spinning his wheels. But we're getting caught in the dust of that. And so what do we do with that? We know that our enemy studies us, and he knows one of the biggest ways to attack us is in our most vulnerable place, which is what? Our children. But again, take that deep breath because God is good. God is sovereign. He is in control. So I'm just going to briefly share a part of my story so that you know that I have um, experience in the area of uh, sexual and gender confusion. And that confusion led to deception. That deception led to behavior. And that behavior ultimately led to an identity and then a lifestyle. But thank you, Lord, it's lifestyle dot, 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 and now just in all caps, life. No more style to it, baby. Well, I try to do style, <laughs> but it's just life now. You should have seen my style when I first got saved. Thank you, Lord, for the church that I grew up in in New Jersey that were so patient with me. <laughs> Took me a long time to stop shopping in the men's department but praise God I am this flowering feminine bud of a whatever in front of you now and I'm not called bud anymore so that's good too he's so good so I want to share again how we can share with our younger children and our tweens and teens and and um, hoping we have time for that that Q&A so when I was a child, I, growing up, um, I was born in 1966, makes me 55, don't do the math, I want your attention else, elsewhere, but, but so, so back then we didn't have play dates, right? So I just played with neighborhood kids, and for me it was, it was perfect. 
because my best friends in the little part of my neighborhood were all boys, and it worked perfect for me because whether they were boys or not, I still was, I don't want to say identifying as a boy because those weren't words we used back then. I just thought I was a boy. I was very confused about my my gender, which wasn't a word back then. Dr. Money hadn't created gender identity yet. That's a whole nother workshop. But I just thought I was a boy. So when I was old enough to realize that I wasn't a boy by the words I were he was hearing, because Johnny was being called brother and son and, and him, and I was being called daughter and girl and, and her. And so I'm like, wait a minute, Johnny and I were the same. What, what is happening here? And is I don't remember how my parents uh, talked to me through that, but apparently they felt um, like they weren't, I don't know, doing, doing a, a good job of it because when I was eight years old, my mom took me to the doctor and said, my daughter thinks she's a boy, what should we do? And the doctor didn't really know what to do. He just said, well, you know what? She'll grow out of it. She'll make a fine wife someday just let her be her. Well, actually, that very limited uh, diagnosis or treatment that he gave her was actually very practical and real because over 90% of kids that are confused by their gender when they make their way through puberty no longer have that deep confusion about it. But I was not one of those kids. I was still very confused about my gender. So I began to hate my body and so I started to self-injure my body very, very much. And my self-injury actually started at five and six years old. And it was, it was, very, uh, it was a very dark place and a, a very dark time for me. So I didn't know what to do with this body that I hated. And because I had injured it so much, there were marks all over my body. So I hid behind very baggy boy clothes. It is hot in here, isn't it? Is there like some air or something that... Turn on those ceiling fans, brother. I don't know where they are. They're, they're inside the wall. They're, they have a very awesome church here. You'll hear it zzz, and then they'll come down and start spinning. It's a good thing I don't get distracted. So as I got a little bit older, I realized that I liked girls. And I wanted to date girls, but I knew I couldn't because of the abusive ridicule I would have gotten back then. So I didn't date anybody. So now this, along with experiencing sexual abuse, caused me to feel very isolated and alone. So the only thing I could think of to do, because I didn't know God, I had no support system anywhere, I was the only, I wasn't an only child, but I was uh, 15 and 13 years younger than my brother and sister, so I was living as an only child in my home. No one to talk to. Thank God no internet to go to. So not knowing God, I, I handled everything in my own strength. And so the only thing I could think of to do to take away this intense pain was to start drinking and doing drugs. So for me, that started at 12 years old. Massive amount of drugs. By the time I was 14, I was a drug-addicted alcoholic. By the time I was 17, I did over 30 hits of LSD, which one hit can send you into a la-la land that you never come back from. But I did not want to be sober because when I, was in sober, when I was sober, I was confused about my body, about my sexuality, and why my body was being used for such horrific things. When I graduated high school, I tried adapting to what I thought my parents and the culture, the world wanted of me, uh, which was to be uh, with a, a man or, or a boy. And, and so <laughs> I was at a party, and this guy asked me out on a date, which I'd never been out on a date with a guy before. I'd been sexually active with men because when I was 14 and needed drugs, and they were 30-something, and I was at the same party as them, I exchanged myself for those drugs, but no one saw me. No one took time to see me and ask anything about me, but this guy did. So I'm like, you know what? He sees me. That's new. Let's give this a try. And if I go out with him, maybe it'll take away my same-sex attraction and my gender confusion. So I went out with him, and then actually a year later, I married him. 
I was a 19-year-old, same-sex attracted, gender-confused, drug-addicted, alcoholic teenager, and he was a 27-year-old man that had just been released from prison for armed robbery with no job living with his grandmother, and I'm like, I'll do it because I don't want this same-sex attraction. I don't want this gender confusion. I will do whatever it takes to get rid of it. And I thought that was my out. But it wasn't. It just made things work be worse because I became more gender confused. And then he started to physically abuse me. And so I said it right in my heart right then, all men are bad. I made a vow in my heart to never be with a man again. Instead, I'm going to become a man so that I can have the power to stop anything and anyone that comes against me again. And so I came out. I left him. I came out, started identifying as, as gay. I had a brief lesbian identity, but that was too much of a, a, a woman's identity, so I identified as, as gay, and I started identifying in the masculine immediately. And I felt freedom for the first time in my life. And that freedom was real to me. Dressing and identifying in, in the masculine was, was a relief because it made me feel safe. It was deception. I felt free, but what I was experiencing was deception. But it was understandable that I was being deceived by that circumstantially from what I had experienced. But it still doesn't make it freedom. What I experienced was horrendous, but it still doesn't make that true. It, does, it still makes that deception. And so many of our children don't understand that the, the things that they're really experiencing are deception because the world is telling them the opposite. Our kids, it used to be like uh, people our age, right, my age, even though I wasn't raised in the truth of who God was, the truth of who Jesus Christ was, culturally, we still had a foundation of truth. There was men and there was women. There was straight and there was gay. And, and, and that was it when it comes to, to sexuality. But, you know, there was, you know, America was good. And, I mean, there, there was, everything was truth. So when a lie came, it would have to penetrate the truth and make its way in. Now, our kids are being raised up on lies. Their foundation is lies, and it starts in kindergarten with their curriculum, and now we have the truth, and the truth is trying to come in and penetrate those lies. It's a whole different ballgame, but God. So I was walking around in this newfound freedom, and I was actively involved in the gay community, and I had varying relationships with, with women, and and realized that I wanted to settle down and, and meet someone and spend the rest of my life with someone, and I, I met that someone. I never loved anyone like I loved her. I felt like she completed all the parts of me that were lacking. She was the only person in the world I trusted, and my desire was to give her my whole heart, and I thought I did, but what I didn't realize is there was a part of my heart that I could never give her. It was a part of my heart that had been damaged by other people and had been damaged by the way I was living. The way I was living was damaging my heart, but I didn't realize that. I was living my truth. I was walking in freedom now, or so I thought. But it was the part of my heart that was dead. It was dead from sin, and she couldn't touch it. She couldn't have it, and she couldn't fill it. But God could, and God did. He's such an amazing God. Amen. In December of 2002, God met me when both uh, my girlfriend and I cried out to him at the same time and asked him if the way we were living is wrong. You can go on my website and hear the full story. It's pretty like taking myself out of the situation and looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's pretty wild. God's really miraculous. But he answered us by taking us into his holy word in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that in January of 2003, I came to fully believe in the Lord Jesus, surrendered everything to God, including my sexuality, my gender identity, and my girlfriend. We both got saved the same day, walked in as lovers, left as sisters, never to be with each other again. Amen. 
she's still walking with the Lord. She's a missionary in countries doing things that I can't talk about because it's um, illegal. Praise the Lord. But that's, that's who God is. Listen, this is going to be illegal soon. I just had to up the insurance on my ministry um, for, for legal, you know, the legal insurance and stuff because I'm curious if within the next five years that I'll be prison ministry. Praise the God. There's, there's a lot of lesbians there that I can minister to because it's gay for the stay, so wherever God sends me. But I realized God loved me in a way that nobody ever could, and with that love, it changed my life. But I had this new identity in living this abundant life in him. I still had struggles, but everything that I struggled with, I actually brought to the Lord in prayer because I learned right from the start, bring everything to God. I devoured the Bible. I got saved in January, read through the whole Bible by June, read through the New Testament again by the end of the year, and I've been reading through the Bible every year since. It's been 19 years. The word of God is a life changer. If you are not in the word, you are not getting the abundance of the Lord that he wants you to have in him. So I just ask God questions, asking what was the origin of all this stuff that I had. And that's when he began showing me that my own perception to certain events in my childhood led me to be deceived. My perception led to deception. But God was showing me how to walk in his truth instead because truth brings life even when the truth is hard. Even when the truth, the enemy would come in so often and say things like, you're going to be alone for the rest of your life now. How are you going to manage that? And so I learned very quickly. I learned it from Cy Rogers, amazing man. He's with the Lord now. But I learned to take little index cards and write the lie on, uh, on the front of the card and flip the card over on the back with the truth from God's word. I will be with you. I will never leave you and forsake you. Okay, so I'm not alone. The world is telling me I need a physical partner, but God is telling me that he's my husband and I will never be alone. So I was in deep deception and I didn't even have the internet like our kids do now. And that's why we have to teach and reaffirm the truth of God's word to our children. We have to counteract the deception with God's truth daily. Listen, daily, daily, daily as we and they are coming and going. And I don't care if your kid is five or 17 and rolling their eyes at you before they leave your home or like your five-year-old when they get up in the morning or if you want to do it, um, pray over them. And then as they get up, read God's word over them. In the morning, in the midday, and in the evening. And that's why I opened with Deuteronomy chapter 6. But it's not just teaching our children the truth of the Bible the truth of creation, and the truth of salvation in Christ Jesus, we have to be the conversation starters about sex and gender. At at an age we never thought we would have to. I'm sorry that you guys are having to have these conversations with your young children, but you have to be the conversation starter because whatever kids hear first is what they believe, at least for a time. So if what they hear first is a lie, then they're going to have that foundation of a lie and you're going to have to penetrate that lie with the truth. It's more than just the birds and bees talk when they're in puberty. We have to start to tell them about these sexual images and other things that they're seeing when they go to the bank or when they go to Burger King. There's images everywhere. You're going to have gay neighbors, they're going to have gay teachers, gay politicians, gay family members. So whether your kid goes to public school or is homeschooled or goes to a Christian private school, your child is going to be indoctrinated. Hands down, no doubt, doubt they are being indoctrinated. And just a little side thing, the whole trans thing is way more than indoctrination now. It's become very cult-like. And it's very dangerous, and I have these two books that I highly suggest you get if you have a child dealing with anything uh, concerning their gender. Actually, I think you should just get it and read it anyway. This one is called Desist, Detrans, and Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult. 
And this one is irreversible damage, uh, the transgender craze seducing our daughters. I'll put them back on the thing back there, but you can see I have written on there OOEM, please don't take them. <laughs> they are my last copies. So we have to tell them the truth of God's intention over creation. So please, when your children are little, every single week, maybe even a couple of times a week, you need to read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 to them every single week week. Genesis chapter 1, even though I don't believe sex and gender are separate, that's the language we're using now, and that's what your kids will hear, so sex and gender. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, God created them male and female, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. There's sex and gender right there. That is the only way the Lord speaks of uh, gender in the Bible, and with that, he says, be fruitful and multiply. So explain that to them, especially in this culture. It's foundational. Explain to them God created us male and female, boys and girls. Listen, and there's nothing outside of that, even if they hear otherwise at school. I just got a text from a friend, one of those girls that was my youth group girl. She has a six-year-old and a four-year-old uh, children now, and her son was asking questions about some of the things he was seeing. And she just said, yeah, honey, remember, um, there's only two, there's little boys and there's little girls, and anything outside of that's just silly, isn't it? Remember what we read in Genesis? I mean, there's a level that we can share this on with our children, but you're pouring truth in them, so the truth will be their belt, and lies will have to penetrate that truth. You have to remind them that their feelings do not dictate truth because they're going to, again, learn at a young age to follow their feelings. But we have to remind them that our feelings do not dictate truth. As you explain chapter 3 concerning sin, that's when you can introduce the subject of people living outside of God's intention. And that's the perfect time to tell them that we all sin, we all make mistakes, but that doesn't give us the right to be mean to people who aren't living the way God tells them to. And teach them how to pray for people that we see living outside of God's will. This will give them a heart for the lost. Because we know the church in years past has been a, a, a little more leaning towards truth than grace, right? We don't want to have truth without grace, but we don't want to have grace without truth, right? And they have to learn this at home because they will see two moms and two dads, whether they're in public schools or homeschooled. Listen, we can, our, our high school kids can go away on youth retreats and, right, we always encourage, you know, hey, bring your unsaved friends. Great. But we bring our unsaved friends. What if they have two moms or two dads? Our kids are going to hear it. We can't not talk about this. And it's, I go to a lot of Christian schools, and I will say it's the LGBT plus identity is very prominent in the Christian schools. Public schools, the kids display their sin, and Christian schools, they, they hide it so they don't get kicked out. But it's there. We have to talk to our kids. Obviously, the conversation will be guided by their age, but keep it simple. God declares right versus wrong, teaching them not to criticize or judge those who are different. And this is important. Let your child ask you questions without them seeing fear or especially disgust on your face. That is so important, you guys. And you might have to be the one to bring up the conversation. I also have paperwork back there. Maybe, I don't know if it was handed out. But just a little guideline on some simple questions that you can sit down conversationally and have with your kids. Um, tell them as, when they're littles that sometimes people are confused and don't like the way God made them, so they wish they were the opposite sex, but that they might grow out of that because they're going to see it. And let them know no one can actually change from one sex to the other, even though they might try. You have to get ahead of this, you guys. 
You can't tell them this when they're 15 and they've heard for seven years otherwise. You have to be the first to tell them this stuff. And again, I'm sorry that you have to do this at such a young age. It breaks my heart for you. But God has appointed our pre-appointed times and places. So he knows and he's preparing you for this. Ask them if they see anyone like this at their school. And if they say yes, listen, if they say yes, this is important. Ask them how it makes them feel. Ask them how it makes them feel and then minister to them accordingly. Don't just tell them it's wrong. Ask them how it makes them feel. You need to hear their heart, what they think about it. And don't be shocked if they say it's okay. Bring them back to the truth. They need to know you're a safe place for them to share their true feelings without you getting upset. Then pray with your child for that young classmate of theirs. That will teach them to pray for people that are different than them instead of bullying them or gossiping about them. Because I can hear you, I can tell you, I still hear at some of the youth groups that I go to very derogatory language that some of the, our kids use in youth group, and it's got to stop. Encourage your kids to keep an open dialogue with you so that any questions that they might have, they can bring them to you. Remind them that you won't be upset about with them for, for asking this. They need to know you're a safe place without you being, listen, visibly angry over what they're seeing and experiencing at school. You got to handle it like a champ, mom and dad. And then when they go to bed, you can go in your room and cry or scream in, the pool, in, the, in your pillow go for a ride or whatever, but to your kids, you need, you need to keep it, stay stoic so that they can trust you because tomorrow night, I'm going to tell your kids that I talked to you and encouraged you to be a safe place. Don't make me regret my words, please. Please, it's too important. Your tone and attitude will make an impact on how they see broken and hurt, hurting people. We want our children to learn how to see broken and hurting people the same way Jesus does. So take this opportunity to affirm them in their own gender, because with all their hearing and seeing, they may actually be questioning their own identity. They actually, there's probably more of a chance that they are than they're not. So we need to reaffirm them, male and female, people live outside of that, people question that, it's okay, we pray for them. Affirm them in their gender without going overboard with it and then be that safe place that if they do have questions about it, you'll sit and talk to them about it. It's important to tell them to expect to see sinful behavior at school or in their after school activities. You don't want them blindsided or confused by the things they're seeing. Sheltering your child isn't beneficial. There's so many kids that drop off the, the, off the Christian um, identity once they leave home and, and go to college. Affirm them in who they are in Christ. Affirm them, remind them to love God, to trust him, and to know and believe his word. Listen, you have to let your own life mirror that. Let who you are point to who he is. Let them see Jesus in you. So that's our littles. Um, the things uh, with our tweens and teens, um, they are looking for acceptance. Do you remember, remember how gnarly, I use the word gnarly because I live in California now. <laughs> is, is that what I do? That, okay. I'm so stoked to be here with you guys. All right, that's it. That's all the California language I have. Um, but remember, remember how hard puberty was? And that was without, for most of us, without the internet or at least social media. Now our kids, the acceptance that they're getting. Listen, I want you guys to write this down. I want you to watch two shows for me. This one's on Netflix. If you don't not like Netflix, join the club, get the free day 30 trial, watch this, and then cancel it. <laughs> it's called The Social Dilemma. Not the social other thing that that, yeah, not that one. The social dilemma on Netflix. Then go to YouTube 
and watch Childhood 2.0. Childhood 2.0. This will give you a better understanding of what our kids are experiencing on the internet because we don't fully understand what they're experiencing and they don't know how to talk to us about it, so we have to understand, please, 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 before this week is over, could you guys please watch that, those two things? It's so important. And then put a little reminder on your calendar to cancel Netflix within 30 days. <laughs> and Disney, while you're at it. <laughs> but kids are gonna search for something when they're missing something. Kids are going to search for something when they're missing something. And 2020 wrecked our kids. And so they're really missing something. So they are searching. Our kids are overexposed to all things media and they're in danger if they're using the internet to find answers to their questions, which they probably are. But tomorrow I'm going to tell them to go to you because you guys will sit and listen. Kids want to be heard, they want to know they're loved, and they want to be seen. So even though they'll never admit it or fully understand it, the person that they want to be seen by the most and be heard by the most, and of course be loved by the most, is you. It really, really is. There are studies that show that. They need to know that they can trust you so that they will share with you what's really going on in their life and what they're experiencing emotionally. Listen. You need to hear what they're saying without interrupting and without showing disappointment. Do that later. One of the most damaging things we can do, and if this is something that you've already done, please know that there is a, a forgiveness and there's, there's a, a restoration from this. But one of the most damaging things we can do as a parent when our child is opening up about their identity is saying something like, if they're saying, I'm gay or I'm trans, if <laughs> Lord, protect hearts right now. One of the worst things you can do is respond with, no, you're not. Or you can't be, you're a Christian, you know what the Bible says. It took them who knows how many weeks to muster up the strength to tell you that. They've studied the word of God. They've prayed and asked God to help them. They've studied Leviticus 18 and Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in the, in the Greek, in the Latin, in the English, in the pig Latin. They've studied it in everything. Now they want to talk to you about it in hopes that you'll embrace them. Embracing them doesn't mean embracing what they're doing. It means embracing them. They need a mom and dad. We don't want to put up walls because they'll be very difficult to take down. Instead, ask them, you're going to have to be stoic a lot, mom and dad. Instead, ask them, what do you mean by gay or bi or pan or tran? Encourage them to further explain what they mean by that and then ask them how long they've felt this way. Ask them when they first began to recognize these feelings. And then something like this. Did something you see on the internet make you go, hmm, that's me? Because that's a lot of the stories that I hear from those who are identifying as gay or trans. They're like, oh, I didn't really have words to put to it. But then I went online and saw this you know, gay content creator, or this gay influencer, or this trans influencer, and then I was like, huh, that's me. No, that's not you. That's Satan planting a seed of deception in your heart. I'm sorry. I'm, that was loud. I apologize, but I'm so sick and tired of Satan coming after our kids. Nobody came after me as a kid. Who knows what my life would have looked like if someone would have just told me about Jesus, or if I had parents that knew the, know the truth. I'm not throwing them under the bus, but Nobody shared the truth with me. If they've experienced any kind of loneliness or if they feel rejected, they're going to find somewhere or someone that they can connect to. And the connection will come via the internet if it's not through you. The biggest way to get noticed now is by identifying in any way that is out of the norm on social media. The more drama you have, the more attention you get, and the more likes you get. 
So if you already feel like an outcast, if you already feel lonely, maybe you're different. Maybe you look different. Some of our kids look different. And you're rejected. If you change the way you look a little bit and you put a little gay or pan or tran on your identity, on your profile thing, now looking different gets you credit, gets you likes. But if you don't, if you look different and you don't have an LGBT identifier, then you just look different. So now you have to add this cultural identity along with it to get recognized. From what I've read, oh, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> this is from Newsweek, so I don't know how accurate it is, but Newsweek says that 39% of youth are now identifying as LGBT+. Plus. I believe it's from the indoctrination, or I believe it's from the in, <laughs> introduction leading to indoctrination of social media that's affecting our girls at higher rates than our boys. Now they're be being told on social media that if you don't like what your body looks like or feels like while you're going through pu puberty, it must mean you're trans. So little girls that are starting to, to form breasts, and they don't like it, who does? Well, you must be trans. Boys that are, uh, their body down below is doing some pretty interesting different things and they don't like it or they're embarrassed by it must mean they're trans. It's disgusting what is happening to our kids through the internet and Satan's using it. That's what I was gonna say earlier. Our heart is always receiving seeds, right? We know Jesus talked about seeds. Our heart, there's two seeds our heart's receiving. We're receiving seeds of deception or seeds of truth. And whatever's being watered is going to grow. And for every minute your child spends on the internet, especially so social media, the seed of deception is being watered. You have to be very mindful. Please do not let your child go into their bedroom at night with their phone or with their computer. Do you know that your child is in more danger from pedophiles and sexual uh, assault in the home than they are outside the home now? Your child's safer getting on their bike and riding around the neighborhood than they are taking their phone into their bedroom. There's a neon sign outside, come and get me, when you let them go into their bedroom with their phones. Got to keep everything out in the common area. And listen, it is going to be a fight. It is going to be a fight. But you know what? It's your house. You are mom and dad. And our kids are taking control in ways that God never intended. And they're using language with us that is scaring us. Like, would you rather have a gay, would you rather have a trans son or a dead daughter? This is what they're learning to say on the internet. This is what you have. There's a guy, Jeffrey Marsh. He's got almost like 900,000 or something like that. Uh, he's a non-binary guy. He teaches children how to disconnect with their parents. And this is what our children are seeing. We have to be a safe place for them to talk about this stuff. Who's talking so much, man? We hardly have any time left for Q&A. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hope that... Um, all right, I just want to talk about this before we get into the time of Q&A. Um, when, when I uh, do things like this, there's usually a lot of people that want to talk afterwards. And if someone comes up and tells me, I have a, a child that's identifying as trans now, I ask them, you know, if they're, they're under 20 years old or 25 years old at, at this point, um, I ask them two questions. Are they on the spectrum? <coughs> Meaning, do they have Asperger's or high-functioning autism? And about between 30 to 35% of them say, yes, how did you know? And then the second question I ask them is, do they watch anime? Oh. And 100% of the time, 100% of the time, these kids say yes to anime. I just want you to read, yes, anime, from the pit of hell. If I was texting it to you, it would be all caps, from the pit of hell. 
It is Japanese animation, and they have how many, how many gods do they worship in Japan? It's, it's all the characters are androgynous. There's, there's, there's pedophilia. There's, there's different genres within it. There's boys with boys. There's sadomasochism. There's girls with girls. It's from the pit of hell. Let me just read you a couple because we have so much time. <laughs> um, let me read a couple of things about... Um, Here's from a, a, a young, young girl. Like a, a tw- she's either a tween or a teen. I guess she's a teen. Um, I lost one of my earliest best internet friends when she became addicted to yay OI. It's Y-A-O-I. I think that one is the boy-on-boy anime. It completely changed her, and it was rough watching her go through that. Her friend group changed, she changed, and I got kicked to the curb. That was in 2005, this junk's very real. Um, Here's from a mother. Are there any good anime shows? Or is the fandom, meaning the fans, or is the fandom, or is it the fandom that ruins it? My girls were into Haikeyu, and then see the fandom shipping all the boys together, which led to my daughter reading gay porn. They love anime and drawing anime. Stinks, everything has to be toxic. I spoke to a young lady the other day who uh, just uh, broke up with her girlfriend, came to Christ, she wanted to talk, and she started telling me her whole life story, and she's like, okay, this happened, and then this happened, and she's like, and then I started watching anime, and that's when my whole world changed. She's like, I was introduced to pornography through anime. So I'm just going to have my notes here. If you guys want to come take a picture later, you can see what some of these different uh, subcultures of anime are and uh, be mindful that your children um, are... (laughs) Josh, what's your last name, Josh? Josh Collins. Type in on YouTube, Josh Collins Anime, and he did a really good... Uh, uh, message on that. Josh Collins dash anime, and he'll get into um, deeper. I I mean, I I, I have story after story in my notes, but I I don't want to take the Q&A time. Um, But anime is just evil, you guys. And and your kids are addicted to it. They have, they consider some of the characters on the shows that they watch their boyfriend or girlfriend. They have boyfriends and girlfriends on Metaverse, and they think it's real. Tell me how nasty Satan is. See, I can get mad and angry and have all these faces with you guys because I don't have kids. But remember, you guys have to be all nice and and stoic. So, um, again, they, they need to know that you are a safe place to talk about this. Um hear their stories, hear the stories of their friends, Uh, pick a day of the week to fast and pray for your child. Um, And and again, for for those of you that have adult children that are identifying as as LGBT plus, um, uh, you need need to have a prayer group. You need to have people praying for, for you because your life is going to change. Your walk with the Lord is changing because of your child's identity. Allow the Lord to minister to you. Find a safe place to, to cry and to be raw and real with friends and uh, people at, at church that won't judge you. And remember, sh- sh- usually shame is the first thing a parent feels when their child comes out to them. That is not your shame to carry. If you have been Um, a parent that's done pretty nasty things, sit and talk to your child about it. Apologize to them if if you need to do that. But remember, that is not your identity to carry or your shame to carry. Allow the Lord to minister to you. Pray for your child's partner. Pray for them. Don't be mad at them. Pray for them. I believe in, uh, and unless it's a very toxic relationship that they're in, I believe in uh, bringing their partner into your life as well so that they can see 
who Jesus is through you, because remember, let who you are point to who he is. And <laughs> I would imagine, I'm curious if your child is like, yeah, my mom and dad, they're Christians, and it's all holy, 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 Jesus, Bible, you know, all this. And, you know, your, your child might say some um, unkind things about you, but when their partner spends time with you and sees how awesome you are, that car ride home is going to be an interesting one for your child and that person. I like your parents. When can we go back? And you might be the, the, um, the final seed or sprinkle of, of water as God gives the increase to, to save your, your child's partner. Amen.